Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. We're going to get started. My name is Rachel Smith. I'm a senior in the College of Business and president of our Business Ambassadors organization. It is my honor today to introduce our Dean, Ali Malexade. Dean Ali arrived at Kansas State in June of 2011 and hit the ground running. Among his many accomplishments since coming to campus are the creation of the Executive Mentor Program and the Professional Advantage Program. He also led the college in the development and construction of our new $60 million business building, scheduled for completion in July of 2016. The Dean holds a bachelor's degree in management and a master's of business administration from the University of Denver. He earned his business administration doctorate in strategic management from the University of Utah. Thank you, Dean Ali, for your leadership and, and encouragement. You have truly made the CVA a place where every student can succeed. Please join me in welcoming the Edgerly Family Dean of the College of Business, Dean Ali. Well, good morning, everyone. Are you guys are awake? How many are awake? Raise your hands. Yeah, thank you. And how many of you have cell phones? Please turn them off. This is a good chance to do that. Okay. Um, Rachel mentioned that she's graduating soon. And with great students like Rachel, we don't want them to graduate. Okay, so Rachel, we'll put your graduation back maybe two years. Is that okay? All right, yes. Uh, <laughs> Of course, I'm kidding. We like to have people, uh, students like Rachel graduate, get great jobs, which she just have, uh, has, and be incredibly successful. And then just in a blink of an eye, she will be back as a distinguished speaker, just like our speaker today. Uh, so that, those are the expectations, actually, we have from all of you sitting in the audience, that you will be back and be incredibly successful because of the education you've had at K-State. And be out here and talking to the next class and the next class. Well, my job today is to introduce the sponsors for this program and our good friend, Tom Giller, Community Bank President, Commerce Bank of Manhattan. Uh, Tom is the Community Bank President of a 250 million asset size bank with 42 employees. The bank is part of the Commerce Bank Shares Organization which totals 23 billion in assets with 46 uh, in 46 communities in five states. Tom has been with Commerce Bank most of his 34 years and has held several executive roles with Commerce, including lending, accounting, corporate services, and retail manager. Mr. Giller graduated from Kansas State University in 1984 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Finance. He continued his education with graduate degrees from the Stonier Graduate School of Banking at the University of Delaware and the Graduate School of Retail Banking at the University of Wisconsin. Mr. Giller is actively involved in the Manhattan community, a board member of the Friends of McCain, Kansas State University Foundation Advisory Trustee, Downtown Manhattan Economic Development, and chairs the K-State baseball season ticket drive. So a great community banker, please welcome Mr. Tom Giller. Boy, I think of the Dean as Superman. He does such a fantastic job, and, and I know he runs around the campus and the business school, but I think he's got a cape uh, hidden somewhere because I'm not sure how he gets from point A to point B to point C uh, in the speed that he does. So thank you, Superman, for the nice introduction. <laughs> I'm very pleased to introduce Mike Goss today as our speaker. And what I really like about Mike is his passion for life in, in many different ways. Um, his passion for his family, his passion for his friends, his passion for his business interest, for tennis, and for Kansas State University. And he is so involved in what we call time, talent, and treasury to the university, and, and that passion shows. And I think this is a great example of the speech today. 
Mike, it says retired, but I'm gonna say semi-retired from Bain Capital in December of 13, following 13 years with the firm in various senior management capacities. He joined Bain Capital in 2001 as managing director and chief financial officer. In 2004, he assumed additional role of chief operating officer, adding responsibility for Bain Capital's global human resources, legal, and investor relation activities. During his tenure in these roles, Mike oversaw the firm's growth and assets under management from, and this is amazing, 10 billion to 70 billion, global offices from four to nine, and worldwide employment from 200 to 940. Today, he serves as special advisor to the firm while pursuing independent business, philanthropic, and personal activities. Prior to joining Bain, he was executive vice president and CFO of Digital <coughs> Inc. Before that, he was executive vice president, CFO, and a member of the board of directors of Playtex Products, Inc. Mike graduated from Kansas State University in 1981 with a bachelor's in science, magna cum laude, in economics, and from the Harvard Business School in 1986 with a master's of business administration with distinction. He is a member of the board of directors of Platform <laughs> Specialty Products, Tennis Channel, the International Tennis Hall of Fame, the Kansas State University Foundation, and Tenacity, Inc. He resides in Westport, Connecticut, is married to his wife, Becky, and they have two grown daughters, Emma and Lucy. Let's give a nice, warm K-State welcome to Mike Goss. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Tom, for, for that wonderful introduction. It was exactly as I wrote it, uh, which is always good. Um, and also, thank you uh, to all of you for attending this morning. I know it's purely optional that you're here, and so I feel like you've entrusted me with uh, an hour of your life to make sure it's meaningful and that you learn something from it. So I appreciate the vote of confidence in, in just you being here. So we'll, we'll try to make it work. Um, as my wife will tell you in somewhat annoying fashion, I see most issues in life through the prism of K-State football, and the lecture uh, that we're gonna talk about this morning is, is no, no different. Now, if you're a student here, you've only known one way at Kansas State, and that's a winning tradition. But for those of us who have been around for a while, you know, we know that other things can happen with K-State football, and so we are particularly proud to have seen the rise of Kansas State football from what it was when I sat in your chair uh, uh, to what you guys uh, now enjoy. But how was it that, that, uh, that K-State football got to be so good? Um, I think if you were to ask Coach Snyder, he would say it's because each and every day uh, they did things just a little bit better. And when you do that over a 20-year span, you do get better. He is... Uh, uh, written down what he calls the 16 goals for success. Um, and it's a way that he and his players can uh, manage their daily lives and end up uh, with a much better football program as a result. Not, not surprisingly, our athletic department under, under the guidance of John Curry and the wonderful team he's assembled also has a mission statement, five points that guide their activities every day. Uh, it's only five compared to Snyder's 16. I know there's a joke buried somewhere in there, but I, I haven't been able to figure out what it is. Um, um, but what I wanted to talk to you uh, about this morning is what goals for success should you have? It seems to work for Snyder and the football team. It works for Curry and the athletic department. Certainly it'll work for us as students and people preparing for a career that we also have goals for success. Um, so the way I want to talk about that this morning uh, under, under the dean's uh, advice and Council was to take a look at uh, a project that I worked on early in my career uh, as a representative sample or case study, if you will, uh, about a real life project that I worked on. And we're going to look at all the, the skills that it took along the way uh, to be successful in that project. And then perhaps from that, 
be able to draw some conclusions about what you should be doing now while you're a student at Kansas State University so that when your time comes to work on a project like this, you'll be uh, uh, prepared uh, to succeed, just like Coach Snyder's team is prepared because they've lived by these 16 rules. Okay, that's what we're going to do. So let's get started. Um, back in 1992, I was 32 years old, uh, and I was uh, in charge of mergers and acquisitions for a New York Stock Exchange company called Oak Industries. Um, it's relatively small by New York Stock Exchange standards. It only had revenue of $140 million. But what it had of, of great value was a $180 million net operating loss carry forward. And this is going to be the only technical part of my discussion. Uh, what is a net operating loss carry forward? Well, tax law, corporate tax law in the United States says that if you have earnings from this activity and you have losses from this activity, the government is at least fair enough that they won't just tax your the earnings from the profitable activity and not pay attention to the losses you've incurred in the other activity. So they allow you to net those gains and losses. So if you earn 100 here and you lose 100 there, you actually owe no taxes. They also allow, if the timing is wrong, so that if you make a bunch of money and then you lose a bunch of money and you're not actually netting those in the same year, you can carry that loss forward until you do make money. And that's what happened with the case of Oak Industries. They were a very profitable co company. They uh, were in the business of subscription television. So this is before cable. So if you can imagine back in the day <laughs> where all TV signals were delivered over the air, um, kind of the precursor to cable television was that Oak Industries owned a bunch of television stations that, that broadcasted an encrypted signal. And then you could pay for this box, put it on your TV, and would unencrypt the signal. And it was the early subscription television. And that's what Oak Industries did. Well, it worked beautifully until cable television came along, in which case it just obliterated that subscription television service. Who would put a box on their TV and pay 20 bucks a month for one station when cable comes along and you have all those other uh, things to choose from? So Oak Industries went from being a very profitable company to a very unprofitable company. And as a result, they had $180 million of operating losses, which they couldn't yet offset with earnings from any other business. Well, I was part of a management team that was brought into Oak Industries to help turn it around, to reposition the company by selling its bad businesses, buying new businesses, and hopefully using this net, net operating loss carry forward so that any business we bought wouldn't be a taxpayer until it had earned more than $180 million. Does that make, make sense? so far. So as an acquirer, we were a very formidable acquirer. Because where the people we were bidding against would probably be paying taxes, we wouldn't be. So we could afford to pay just a little bit more than the next guy and, and uh, uh, shield the next $180 million from, from taxes. So that was the mission. So to be in charge of uh, mergers and acquisitions for this business you know, was a pretty, pretty cool thing. So just a little detour. Um, by the way, I, I do want to make this point. What I'm talking about today is, uh, is an acquisition, um, and that was my job. Uh, the lessons I'm going to draw for you as a student at the very end apply to any kind of business question, not just this is, if you're here to learn about M&A, you will be disappointed. That's not what this is about. This is about how to prepare yourself uh, for any kind of question. So if you're a salesperson, and you've been asked to uh, uh, figure out a, a sales plan for a new territory, or you're a marketing person, and you're, and you're trying to figure out a launch plan for a new product, or if you're a manufacturing person, and you're trying to decide whether or not to introduce a new product or to build a new plant, what I'm going to uh, advise you today on how you prepare for those questions are all going to be the same. This just happened to be a merger and acquisition kind of question. So this is the process. Um, you spend a lot of time. Uh, creating deal flow, which means just generating ideas for your company to acquire. Then you do due diligence, which means you're investigating the company and trying to decide whether it's anything you want to own, and if you want to own it, what price you should pay. Kind of next door to that is financing. How are you going to pay for it? We happen to have a lot of cash on the balance sheet at Oak Industries from assets that we had sold. 
but we could also borrow money. We could use our New York Stock Exchange stock. There was all kinds of ways to finance the acquisitions we were going to do. So that's kind of part of the equation. And then you have to own the darn thing after you buy it. That's a whole nother, uh, that's a whole nother uh, part of the uh, merger and acquisition process. Um, you're negotiating pretty much uh, around those first two boxes. So while you're doing you do your due diligence, you're also negotiating with the seller on the price and any other terms that might exist. And certainly, if you're borrowing money from the bank uh, or, uh, or uh, giving the seller any kind of uh, stock or anything like that, there's certainly negotiations around that. And then the often overlooked part of the M&A process is there is courtship along the whole way here. You are trying to woo the sellers in, in the deal flow process. You have to, uh, in doing due diligence, you can't be a bull in a china shop while you're conducting your investigation. When you're negotiating the financing, again, there's people skills involved with that. And certainly when you own the business afterwards, you certainly are constantly working with the new management team uh, of the business you acquired. So don't forget the courtship part of this whole process. So as I said, I was in charge of mergers and acquisitions for Oak Industries, and we looked at hundreds of companies uh, before we found one. Oh, one, uh, one last point. Because I only have essentially 35 minutes to speak, I could speak for days uh, on, on, on this particular uh, project that we worked on. I am only going to focus on what we did during the due diligence phase, because you'll see that's all you need to know to form our goals for success at the end. So after looking at hundreds of companies, we found a company in Phoenix, Arizona called Gilbert Engineering. They make uh, connectors that go into the infrastructure of a cable TV system. Uh, the stuff that's up on the poles, um, which you probably have no appreciation for. I know I didn't until I worked on this company. Uh, all the way back to where it plugs into the back of your TV set, those little connectors that you see um, uh, with coaxial cable that connect to the back of your TV. That's what Gilbert Eng Engineering made. Um, they were the price and quality leader, um, which means that, that they were the highest price connector in the business, um, but they generally commanded that high price because they were known to have the highest quality product. It was 60 million in revenue, so compared to Oak Industries, 140 million in revenue, this was gonna be a significant addition uh, uh, to our company, and it was highly profitable, generating $20 million, so it was perfect uh, if you have a net operating loss carry forward and you have $180 million to burn, if Gilbert didn't grow, you know, for the next nine years, we, were, we would be paying no taxes, where most other uh, potential buyers for Gilbert Engineering would be paying taxes. So it was perfect. This deal was actually brought to our attention by Bain Capital, uh, which I later uh, uh, went to work for. Um, I like to think because of my performance on this deal, but, you know, who knows? Might have been some other things. Uh, uh, but Bain brought this idea to us. Uh, they had identified Gilbert Engineering, and quite frankly, it was so profitable, it was so profitable, you know, that they couldn't hardly uh, afford to buy it, but they knew that we were sitting there with our net operating loss carry forward, so they thought that we'd be perfect uh, uh, partners. Um, of course, tax law required that we own 80% of the business, and Bain could only own 20% of the business, because, you, you know, remember, we're trying to match whoever lost the money with who's making the new money, to be fair. So it's a good public policy requirement that we end up owning 80% and Bain own 20 But we decided to be partners with Bain uh, in, in pursuing um, Gilbert Engineering. So this is what they make. I'd never seen them before. You know, they're about like this long. Uh, they cost 18 to $20. Um, if you uh, are walking home tonight, um, go look up on the, go look up on the, the wires that, that hang above the ground, and you'll see these things. Uh, Any time a, a cable, uh, a coaxial cable is cut, these things are put into the boxes or into the feeder that then goes into your house. But they're all over the place up there. Um, Gilbert did make the cheap stuff that goes in the back of your TV. This is the stuff that's inside your house, but they're very inexpensive. These these things cost like 35 cents. Not a whole lot of money not terribly complicated, a lot of product from the Far East to compete with, but that big stuff, the expensive stuff, the stuff that really mattered to the cable operators is why Gilbert Engineering was so, was so profitable. So this is what a cable system looks like. Um, there is a, 
this, is, this part's called the head end, and from, so it receives the signal from ESPN and all the, all the various um, cable networks, tennis channel, uh, broadcasts into, uh, uh, broadcast into, uh, into the head end, and then the signal is distributed uh, over, uh, over coaxial cable all the way to your house. This, these big fat things are called the trunks, and generally the way cable uh, systems are laid out is kind of a hub and spoke system where a whole bunch of trunk lines go out to the neighborhood. This is called a node, and then from the node, it splits off into 100 different uh, streets and then ultimately to your house. So it shoots off and this kind of thing. These are big fat cables that have lots of capacity, and as it gets closer and closer to your house, there are amplifiers uh, to boost the signal along the way. Every time that, uh, every time that, that they need to cut in to, to go to your house, there's a box up there, and you have to have a connector there, you have to have a connector there, you have to have one there, you have one there. And they're all over the place, if you just know what to look for. In fact, in any mile of cable system, there are $630 worth of these connectors. Now you can see here, most of, them, most of them are of the type that are up uh, on, on the lines, the aluminum type, the expensive type, the type we were really good. But there is, so that's $450 of any mile, but there is $180 of the, of the little brass stuff. Well, this was Gilbert's performance, uh, a pretty strong performance. They had grown on average 8.7% per year between the period 1981 and 1992. And as you can see, profit was also growing along those lines. Profit had grown faster than sales, which means, of course, that their operating margins were expanding. That's, that's just the math of it all. This little pattern kind of bothered people. You know, what happened in 1991, and, you know, certainly this was a period of time when cable television was rapidly expanding in America. What would the business look like in the ongoing course? That was a big question, but people were certainly bothered by this little thing. What was going on there? This is... Uh, their operating margins in percentage terms. This was also a little bit troubling. After years of growth, it was starting to decline. So the questions that we were needing to address to decide whether or not we wanted to buy this company, and if yes, what price should we pay, really hinged on, on three questions at the end of the day. This is supposed to be a stoplight, by the way. It's the best I could do. The big question, the big question, was fiber optics. This is 1992. Fiber optic cable was just coming to four. Um, the price of fiber optics was falling dramatically. And, and the, the widely held prediction for anyone looking at this business was that fiber optics was going to obliterate coaxial cable. And therefore, the need for Gilbert's connectors, because you don't use connectors in, in fiber optics. You know, we made, we made connectors that only went to coaxial cable. That was a huge red flag, both to us, but also other bidders, who in many cases chose not to even pursue Gilbert Engineering because they thought they were so smart about fiber optics. Then there's the question about margin sustainability. This is a very profitable business, but that's because the market was growing. Would, this, would they still be able to maintain their pricing and maintain their operating margins in the face of a contracting market? I mean, generally, once markets start to contract, margins will also contract because people have to start fighting for the business, and one way you fight is by price. So that was a big concern. But then there was also, we knew, there was a green light uh, in, in terms of international opportunity. At that point in time, 1992, cable television was largely an American phenomenon. Uh, and cable was just starting to come, to come uh, in, into being in Europe. So we kind of felt, and we were uh, strictly a U.S. company at the time, was there an opportunity to expand this business uh, into Europe? We felt like that was nothing but green. So this is what we uh, embarked upon. Let's answer these three questions. This was the project. This, is, this was what we had to do in the due diligence phase of this business. Um, so as I mentioned, everyone was running from fiber. Oh my gosh, this is going to kill this business. We happened to find out, um, you know, kind of from the management team and a little bit from the body language of the sellers, there weren't a whole lot of people planning to bid for this business. They thought fiber optics was going to 
was going to really obliterate this business, and maybe not obliterate it, but certainly was going to be a, a shadow of what it once was. Well, that was when we decided, you know, there's enough positive here, we should probably explore that question. So what we did, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to grab some water, is we decided to interview everybody we could find who'd be willing to talk to us in the cable television business and really learn the economics of w what it is to lay out a, a, a cable system and, and really test this uh, hypothesis about was fiber going to destroy the business of Gilbert Engineering. So we and the Bain guys talked to over 20 uh, customers of Gilbert Engineering, and these are the people who actually you know, design these systems and build these systems. We went to two trade shows, one in Las Vegas, one in New Orleans, and just walked the halls and talked to anyone we could find in the cable equipment business or, 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 or cable um, uh, service business. Um, there are businesses who, who lay out these cable systems for people. We talked to engineers um, to get to the bottom of this. And what we found was pretty interesting, and no one else found this. Um, remember this drawing where I showed you the, the trunk and split? One thing that became quite clear was that fiber optics was really only going to be economic way out here in the trunk lines. Once you start getting into the neighborhoods, and you get to these nodes and you start splitting off uh, into the neighborhoods, there's very little fiber optic there. That fiber optics is too darn expensive, way more expensive than coax. Um, and it's not necessary. You know, the, the coax creates a ton of capacity, which is needed up here, in, up here in, the, in the trunk lines. But once you get into the neighborhoods and you start splitting it, fiber optics is overkill. And it's way uneconomic. So what we found was that um, if you look at, at uh, the economics of the cable system, if you will, this is total, the head end, that's the satellite, accounted for about 10% of the cost of, of cable uh, uh, television. The trunks were another, you know, 15%. And then 75% uh, of the money spent by cable systems was actually in the neighborhoods, where fiber optics was not going to be a big threat. You look at it on mileage, so you're basically taking out the head end. Most of the miles uh, in the cable system are there. If you look at the, the then you translate that into, into where the connectors are, most of the connector dollars aren't ever, ever going to be affected by cable tele, or by, uh, by fiber optics. And when you look at Gilbert's sales, how much of their stuff went into, into the trunk network, a very small part would actually be affected by fiber. I, I, I reduced it to one slide. I'm telling you, that was weeks worth of work uh, and talking to a lot of people to figure, to, to, to figure that out. But that was our conclusion. Well, this is kind of good. This kind of says that Gilbert's not going to be obliterated. You know, it'll kind of maybe go down, what, by 15% if all of that area does go to fiber? And certainly not all of it would go to fiber. So at least we concluded that there's a baseline under which Gilbert would, would, would never fall below. But there was actually more upside to the story than that that we discovered. So remember, we're largely a US company. And the US at this time in 1992 was largely fully penetrated. You know, every neighborhood that was ever going to have cable TV had cable TV. Going to be a whole lot of new build going on. So if this is what all, all the story was, you'd probably never buy this business. That'd be a waste of your NOL. Well, there's also some maintenance. Um, and the cable plant we discovered, the national cable plant, was about time to be upgraded anyway. So there would be you know, some, some general maintenance. A lot of times we found that cable systems, they were in such a rush to grow that they didn't lay out very well and didn't lay out economical, e economically. Or if this was Manhattan, you know, and you have all that growth out uh, to, to, the, to the north and west, you know, the, the, the cable system would have to follow where the growth was and so forth. So we did conclude that, hey, you know what, there's a good baseline of business um, if this was all G G Gilbert did. But this was what we discovered that we really loved. And that was that when cable operators did upgrade that trunk line with fiber optics, all the downstream stuff had to be replaced. Wasn't a choice. 
had to because suddenly that pipeline at the trunk that was being um, now, uh, you know, where the fiber optics was, was going to deliver so many more channels and, and internet and gaming and video on demand that everything downstream also had to be replaced. And that was going to be the bonanza for Gilbert Engineering that no one else saw. So we were projecting 7.5% growth where everyone else was kind of projecting, oops, everyone else was projecting, you know, down here. We were projecting up here. When we looked at, at uh, what that meant from a, uh, for, from a connector point of view, remember this slide we've already seen, that all those little brass things that you don't make much money on and we weren't very good, they can all stay in place. They didn't need to be replaced. The only thing that needed to be replaced was our stuff. Uh, so that was good news. And it, and it was, again, validated by all of those interviews we did that actually sh uh, we found out that 93% weighted by subscribers, so, you know, weighted by size, 93% of the 20 people we talked to were planning to increase their capital spending budget, not decrease their capital spending budget. So as far as we were concerned, fiber optics was no longer a red light issue. It was a green light issue. And I think we were the only ones to have figured that out. The next, the next question was margin sustainability. Well, now that we've taken away the, the prospect of a declining market and price pressure from that, was there anything else going on there? We looked at a lot about the costs and the price of aluminum and the price of brass, and we did all that. But this was really the heart of the matter, which is when we talk to the people who work on these cable systems, you know, whether you pay $18 for that connector or $19 for that connector was really no big deal. They are very, very important. You are, you're sending a technician out there that makes $100 an hour, and you're going to try to save a buck on the connector. Um, uh, yet that, 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 when you sell that $1, when you sell, you know, 5 million connectors, that $1 <laughs> adds up uh, to $5 million of extra operating profitability um, for you. And so we found that there were a lot of issues that were more important than price in selecting these connectors, and that's where Gilbert was a leader. So we felt like the margins in, in this business could also be sustained. And then there was this international question. Um, the U.S. at that time, 65% of all homes were, were covered by cable television, and the others were in rural areas and stuff like that, and you know, I think t even today, so this is 1992, I think even today the U.S. is kind of 72% covered. So. You know, this kind of covered most, most, of the, most of the country. But these other countries were just in the early part of their development. Now, I do want to caution, and we spend a lot of time on this, it's a mistake for Americans to think that the natural order of things is to become America. Um, that might not happen in some of these other countries. So, for example, in a lot of these countries, satellite television came along, and they kind of skipped right over the, the cable TV uh, business and went straight to satellite. You know, the same is true of telephone. A lot of, lot, of, lot of these third world countries never went through the landline business the way we did in the United States. So if you went and projected a lot of landline telephone growth in the third world, you would have been sadly mistaken. They went straight to wireless, and the same thing happened here. But still, there was a lot of growth in foreign markets uh, in 1992 that we thought we could capitalize, and we pr pretty much confirm that uh, in, in the course of the interviews and the due diligence process. So at the end of our diligence phase, we thought we had three green lights. This is a good company. It's going to experience uh, growth that no one else saw. It's going to be continue to be highly profitable, so perfect for a NOL uh, kind of acquirer. And it had the whole international story as, as, as nothing but upside. So how did it, how did it pan out? Well, this is what Gilbert looked like uh, at the time that we bought it. It was $60 million in revenue, $20 million in profit, so a 33% operating margin. It had no international business. We ended up buying it for $110 million. Uh, we borrowed 90, and we put in $20 million of our own uh, money, which means that we bought this business for five and a half times operating profit. That number five and a half was a very low number. Um, today, 
you know, even for a low growth business, you're probably paying seven times uh, operating profit for, for a very low business. We feel like we bought this business for such a low price because we were the only ones who figured out this fiber optic question. Everyone else just took fiber optics at face value, skipped the auction, no one showed up. Came time for Merrill Lynch, who owned this business, Merrill Lynch Private Equity owned this business. We were the only ones there with any money. Uh, and so we bought the business for five and a half times. In 1996, we were approached by Corning uh, Fiberglass to buy this business. Um, and we sold it uh, in 1996. And at the time we sold it, Gilbert had doubled its sales to 122 million. It had more than doubled its operating profit, which means our operating margin was 38%. In the four years that we owned it, we bought two businesses in Europe, one in Denmark and one in France. I got to work on those, great fun, great fun. And when you're selling a vibrant business, you're not selling it for five and a half times operating profit, you're selling it for 9.3 times operating profit, which leads to a perfect storm. We had paid off all the debt. So what this means is we turned our $20 million into $426 million in four years. Now they don't all work out this way. I had to go all the way back to 1992 to find a good example. So they don't, they don't all work out this way. This is, what you want, this is what you want to have happen. But this was particularly rewarding because it's like making a trick shot in pool or horse, uh, you know, playing basketball. When you call the bank shot and you hit the bank shot, it feels really good. It feels really good. So that being the case, now I want to get to the punchline of, 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 of the story, really, which is uh, I had the good fortune to be in position to work on this, on this uh, project early in my career. And I felt like I was pretty well prepared to do it. Um, in large part because of my education here at Kansas State University. And it, it, it provided a, a foundation for me to lever my experience here into a really rewarding uh, kind of uh, experience. So what could you guys learn from this you're not going to ever do a deal in the cable television business. <laughs> you might not even be in mergers and acquisitions. All fine. That's all good. What is it that you can learn that you can do today while you're a student and put together your own goals for success the way Snyder has for the football team? What should you be working on if this is the kind of project you want to be prepared for when you hit the streets uh, in, in your career? So I'm, I'm going to recommend five points. Uh, another reason why I didn't make fun of John Curry for only having five, because that's all I could come up with as well. Uh, uh, the first um, uh, is to think holistically. You know, in this case at Gilbert Engineering, it was, it was not an accounting question. It was not a finance question. It was not a math question. It was not an economics question. It was not a psychology question. It was none of those things. Yet it was all of those things. So I would urge you, that when you are putting together your own curriculum and you're putting together uh, uh, what classes you're going to take and, and uh, what you're going to work on while you're here, be able to think holistically at the end of the day. It's a, it, it's a multiple uh, tool toolkit that you need to have. Uh, and make sure that your curriculum uh, that you've put together for yourself enables you to think holistically. Um, and don't just emphasize. Now, I'll t take a little bit of a diversion here. I, s I see and talk to a lot of kids who think that that means multiple majors or double major this, double minor that, da, da, da. I can tell you as a recruiter at Bain Capital, I've never paid any attention to that. Double major, two minors, whatever. What matters is that you have one good major, one good GPA, you graduate in four years, and that you have built yourself a curriculum that enables you to think for the job I'm hiring you for. A little, little, little diversion there. The next thing is people skills. You know, it wasn't easy uh, in the case of Gilbert Engineering due diligence to get 20 cable guys to talk to you for free. Um, they're busy people. Um, they had other things to do besides educate a couple of punks on, uh, on, on, on how cable television uh, works. I'm sure we asked lots of stupid questions along the way before we got to the final answer. Uh, and it takes a, a, a certain amount of people skills to be able to conduct that part of the job. It's not just about the technicals. 
you really need to have people skills. So here at K-State, I'd suggest that you get involved in extracurricular activities. And again, kind of like the advice that I gave you uh, on, on majors, it's not the number of activities that count. You know, not impressed by 11 activities on your resume where you don't do anything of any value in any of the 11. You are far better off having two or three activities where you play leadership roles and you actually develop the kind of people skills that it takes uh, uh, to be able to talk to 20 cable operators. Um, work experience. Um, this is another place where you can, you can find jobs where you can really develop your people skills. When I was in college, I, I sold men's clothing uh, in retail uh, uh, during the summers, and I learned so much uh, in just selling men's clothing. Uh, it, was a, it was a fabulous experience. I also taught tennis lessons. So as a teacher and a coach, you learn, you learn how to uh, persuade people and communicate to people. Don't get hung up on, on, uh, on needing a, a high-powered internship or anything like that. I have two, two daughters a little bit older than you guys, and of course they and all their friends hyperventilate over the need to have an internship and all that kind of stuff. Again, I can tell you as a recruiter, I am equally as impressed, if not more impressed, when I see someone who's waited tables or mowed lawns or painted houses, because I know that person's really worked, and that person has really uh, gone out and mixed it up with people, and I'll bet you that person has some people skills that are fairly unique that you don't get in an internship. So don't, internships are great, I'm not disparaging that, just don't hyperventilate. Go get a, go, go get a real job where you can actually develop these people skills, and you'll be equally as successful, if not more successful, once you hit the workplace. The third is to work on your communication skills. Um, in, the course of this, uh, in the course of this project, uh, one of the funnest things I did was uh, have to convince my very risk-averse boss about this fiber optic question. It was one thing to be convinced yourself. Then you have to go out and convince your boss that, yes, it's worth spending $110 million on this bet based on my analysis. It takes a real communication skill to do that. Once I got the boss on board, we had to get the board of directors of Oak Industries on board. We had three meetings with the, with the board of directors. That involved me writing a three to five page memo to the board in advance of each meeting. So, you know, paragraphs, prose, sentences, structure. Um, three to five pages in advance of each meeting, outlining the case. Then we'd show up at the meeting in which case I'd have to prepare a PowerPoint presentation and then orally present and then defend in Q&A. Each step along the way, I was really glad I'd done uh, all the communication courses I had done here at Kansas State University to prepare me for that. So again, it's a matter of course, course selection. Go seek out classes. They might be in the College of Arts and Sciences, where I found them, uh, that require uh, writing and uh, oral communication skills. And when you're in those extracurricular activities, seek out leadership roles. Um, I, I tend to believe that the leaders of, of these uh, uh, campus organizations and clubs have to communicate to the membership, they have to uh, communicate to the campus, they have to uh, both written and oral. So that's a, while you're doing the extracurricular activities to develop your people skills, take a leadership role and seek out ways to improve your communication skills while you're at it. The next one's think globally. You know, back in 1992, you were either a domestic business or you were an international business. And frankly, more times than not, you were just a domestic business. So back in 1992, we knew this whole Europe thing was gonna be a positive for Gilbert, but it wasn't really mission critical. People don't have that luxury today. Nearly any business you will look at will be somehow impacted internationally. So how do you prepare yourself for that while you're here at K-State. Well, I'm a big fan of study abroad. It was nowhere, nowhere, on the, nowhere on the radar screen back when I was here in 1981. But today, it's a viable option. And the organization uh, uh, here that manages international studies has scholarships available. So if it's a financial issue, that can be addressed. I would argue if it, if it can't be addressed that way, that it's a worthwhile investment anyway. Um, and if that's still not a possibility, I urge you to at least read what you can about international affairs and international business and international economics. Two publications I recommend uh, specifically is The Economist magazine and The Financial Times. Um, you can get them both online. 
they're very, very interesting, very well done, very well read. And I have one more pointer. Um, you don't need to tackle the whole world. Go find a country or two that you might be interested in or that you have a, a fighting chance to go, go work in someday or something that interests you. The UK, Germany, China, Brazil, whatever. And just read everything you can about that one country. Next thing you know, you'll become expert in the continent and in the region. And the next thing you know is at least you'll have a framework uh, for figuring out um, other countries. So it's not as daunting as it might sound. And then the last one, I think, is, is the hardest. Um, it's what I call intellectual energy. And this is about the closest I come to many of Bill Snyder's 16 goals for success. And that is, um, be an active thinker. Um, it was not easy figuring out this fiber optic question. And I have to say, this is what I learned from the Bain Capital guys who are our partners. Those guys are tenacious. They do not take estimates <laughs> for an answer. They don't take no for an answer. They don't trade on hearsay. You think fiber optics is going to be a threat? Prove it. Let's go find out. And you, you think you can learn the answer from talking to three people? No. Let's talk to six. No. Let's talk to 12. No. Let's talk to 20 until we absolutely nail it. That is the hardest thing, uh, I think, of all five of these, is to make sure that you have intellectual energy to just attack issues with tenacity. And it's, and it's just what you do every day. You wake up and you say, I know I'm going to class today. What can I do to be prepared? What can I do after the fact? What can I do after class to review what I learned? You know, he said something that didn't make sense to me. I need to go figure out what that was. And it's just a tenacity intellectually. It's hard work, but it's probably, in my view, one of the most important things you can do. And you can start developing those um, habits today while you're at Kansas State. So those are my, those are my goals for success. It's strictly a recommendation. You know, I, if you haven't read Bill Snyder's, I'd go read his. He's got 16 good ones. Um, if, you, if you disagree with any of these or you don't think that, uh, that they're quite applicable to your own situation, I think the most important thing is that you form your own. Go, go steal some from Snyder, steal some from Goss, make your own. I think the most important thing is that you uh, have in mind what you're trying to accomplish here at Kansas State University, that you commit it to writing, to yourself, and the most important thing isn't really what each one of them is, it's that you've done it. And then you have a framework for all the decisions you have to make, what classes to take, what activities to participate in, what jobs to take, uh, what to do in the summer. Um, once you do this, I think you'll have every bit of uh, chance to be as successful as Snyder. So this is my recommendation. I think we now have like 10 minutes uh, for some q and I'd be happy to, to, to take, those, uh, take those questions. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, when you do these acquisitions and you're partnering with these, like with Bain Capital, for example, did you have any like headbutting or problems working with these other companies in these acquisitions? Oh yeah. So uh, uh, that's you know uh, another need for the people skills. And again, if I had more than 35 minutes to talk about this, it's rich with those kind of issues. Uh, in this particular case, uh, remember for the NOL to apply, we had to own 80 percent of the business, and Bain could only own 20. Well, since they kind of brought us this idea, that was a little irritating to them. They did as much work, uh, you know, as, 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 as they could, and they were, they were only going to, they only made 20% of the 420 million. We made 80% of the 420 million. So, yes, there was some annoyance uh, to that. I would argue they got a pretty good deal, too, because they didn't have to pay taxes on their share either. They used our NOL, which was our contribution to the effort. Um, and so, yes, there was, there was lots of headbutting. Before Corning came along, we had to decide, um, you know, could we buy each other out, and at what price could we buy the other's uh, interest uh, if it ever came to that. So that's, that's definitely a zero-sum game. If I had to buy Bain at a high price, and I would argue for the value we created, one, one of the big issues was, well, I'm not going to buy, I'm not going to pay a, a pre-tax number for this business, because that's my tax NOL that I brought to the, to the table. That was a big, uh, a, a big debate. Um, and so, um, in fact, one of, the, one, of the, one, of the, one of the key negotiation points there, I was, I was up against Mitt Romney himself, so that was kind of cool. I didn't know it at the time, it was so cool, but now I know it to be cool. Um, uh, uh, 
uh, and I would say, actually, to be, to be totally uh, honest, uh, I think Bain Capital got the better end of the deal in just about every respect. But still, uh, we would never have found this uh, opportunity if it weren't, weren't for Bain Capital, so I sleep well at night. Thinking about uh, strengths and um, your role as a leader, what would you say is one of your best or some of your best strengths that help you become a leader and, and managing people in those high stress situations? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I hate answering that question because you kind of have to put humility aside a little bit <laughs> to answer a question like that. I really do believe that I have been successful because I'm from Kansas. Um, Kansas doesn't threaten anyone. Uh, no, no one, you know, no one expects much. Uh, <laughs> there are times, you know, when I'm walking around, when I'm walking around uh, the floor uh, of a manufacturing plant uh, in, at, at Gilbert Engineering, um, you know, I was from Kansas State. You know, I was, I was from Kansas. You know, when I was negotiating with the bankers in New York City over the financing of this, I was from Harvard. Uh, and it, and, it, and, it, and it's, 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 it's always served me well to never kind of lose track of my roots uh, of being in Kansas and just follow my instincts as a Kansan, how you treat people. Um, you lead by example. You, you, you are humble. You check your ego at the door. One, one, uh, uh, one phrase I use a lot in guiding the people who work for me is put, check your ego at the door. Once, once you check your ego at the door and, it, and the issue's not about you and it's just about the business issue, it's amazing what can be accomplished. Um, same way with giving credit to the other members of your team. Um, so if you lead by example, you check your ego at the door, you're not full of yourself, you give credit to your team, your team will follow you in a lot of very, very difficult situations. Uh, there are times when the other product would have worked and I didn't do that very well. And there are times, you know, when I wish I would have, but on balance, you know, I like, I like what I ended up doing. Hunter. Um, yeah. I was wanting to know what's the best advice that you've received throughout yeah. your career. Yeah. So, again, this is going to sound this is going to sound political. So let me get all the way through this uh, explanation. Uh, but um, at at the Harvard Business School, we actually read a case called "Managing Your Boss," and it and it and the advice that was given in this case was uh, make your boss look good. And I don't mean, and I, again, I don't mean that politically. Um, it, it just means that if you woke up every day and said, what am I going to do at work today? And you figured out what was on your boss's agenda. And you figured out what your boss needed to get accomplished. And you just worked on that, you'd, have a, you know, you'd know what to do that day. If you know what to do that day, you knew what to do that week, that month, that year. And if that was your only rule that you followed, you'd be in great shape. That doesn't mean be a butt kiss and you know all that kind of stuff. It just means figure out what's important and work on that. Uh, and that was probably the best advice I ever got. In incidentally, uh, many of you probably know Paul Edgerly. He's another distinguished uh, alum of Kansas State and he's been my mentor all my life. He's four years older than me and he was a DU like I was. And uh, you know, Paul, Paul has been my mentor over the years. Well, there was a time when I was at Bain Capital, I was chief operating officer, and Paul was head of the compensation committee. So we had to work a, a, a very closely together in managing the compensation of the, of the team at Bain Capital. It's very complicated there, really, really complicated there. Um, and, and Paul, who, who does deals for a living, uh, unlike me, who was supposed to make the place work, put his arm around me one day after a meeting, said, Mike, I need you to think for me. Uh, I've got other things on my plate. I need you to tell me what's important in the compensation world, and I need you watching out for my backside. I need you to think for me. That was the easiest piece of instruction. It was just like the 
you know, do, do what makes your boss, you know, look good. Uh, and uh, and that, that little piece of advice, everything became clear. Oh, great. I, all I need to do is keep Paul out of trouble. And, and sure enough, that's what dictated what I worked on. And it worked beautifully. Yes, sir. Just speak. We can hear you. So uh, the question was, what did I do following K-State uh, in order to get to uh, Harvard Business School? Um, I was uh, uh, an economics major in the College of Arts and Sciences. And the reason I did that was because my, it was my intention to go to law school. And so and it was my belief at the time that, uh, uh, at that time, I could craft a better curriculum for myself if I was an arts and sciences major, and then filled all of my electives with relevant business courses that would prepare me for law school. So I took a lot of accounting, a lot of tax, some finance. Um, well, somewhere along the way, uh, a finance professor got a call from a bank in Dallas and said, we don't recruit at Kansas State, but if you have someone you'd recommend that we fly to Dallas to, to interview, um, we'll do that, and he gave them my name, and so I decided to go try this for a little time before law school, and once I got into the banking business, I decided I liked business more than the law, and uh, never, never did the law school thing, never applied, never went, went from there to, to Harvard. Uh, first off, thank you for coming to, and taking yeah, the time to speak yeah. with us. And then on your fifth point up there, intellectual energy, there's some days you wake up and it's tougher to get going than others. Is it just as simple as keeping your goals and objectives in mind, or how do you stay motivated? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I, I, do, I do hate to say it's, it's simple because it's hard. Those are two different, those, those are two different questions. It must not be uh, easy to wake up and prepare yourself for a Big 12 football um, lineup either, I would guess. And so it really is, in my view, what distinguishes the good from the great, is that the great get up and you know, do it. I have a few tricks uh, to myself. I'm a, I'm a big to-do list guy. And uh, if I have a hard time getting the engines revved, uh, I work on the easy stuff first just to build momentum, kind of trick myself into thinking I've accomplished something. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dissect my... <laughs> I'll dissect my to-do list into the smallest things so that I'm crossing things off uh, to, to, generate, uh, to generate energy for myself. Um, and so um, once you get it started, it's a lot easier. Um, so I would not advocate that you turn the engines on and off. Um, but I do advocate that you know once, once you get going, just get yourself going, and the rest of the intellectual energy will follow because it's habit forming. So what is the biggest challenge you've ever faced and what advice do you have on dealing with your challenges? Mm. Wow. Um, so there have been, listen, I've had a charmed life. So it is like my challenges are, uh, you know, tough business questions. Um, you know, whenever I was in a place that was, that was uncomfortable uh, or I was behind the eight ball or the challenge seems too big and how am I ever going to do this or I, I made a wrong decision, uh, my advice, and I've given this to my daughters and to my daughter's friends, so I really do believe it, is to just trust yourself. Take a deep breath. Trust yourself. If you... I think by the very fact that you've chosen to volunteer to be here for an hour, you guys are already in the, you know, in the cream of the crop at Kansas State, the, the group here who's chosen to be here this morning. So my bet is that you can all afford to, to trust yourself. Um, and there's very few issues in business that are, that are grave, you know, that you can't get out of uh, by just taking a deep breath, you know, kind of, okay, let's just calm down, let's think this through. Let me figure out what I can do, but trust your instincts, trust your capabilities, trust yourself. You'll be all right. I promise you. Okay.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Stand here for a minute. Well, you notice as Mike spoke, uh, the word negotiation came over that deal. And the part that he didn't have time to emphasize is how much on your daily life you're negotiating. Every single day you're negotiating, whether it's with your boss, with your team members, and others. And the skills you need to do well in your negotiations are laid out right there. A holistic analysis, people skills, communication skills, Think globally beyond the curtain, the, the certain issues at hand, and also intellectual energy to carry it through. And you'll be surprised how well that works. Um, you know, Tom, in introducing Mike, mentioned how much he does for K-State. Uh, any of you have been to the football stadium? Okay, you probably saw the Goss family, what is it, courtyard? Terrace. Terrace, thank you. Up there and enjoyed your hot dogs up there. <laughs> Uh, how many of you play tennis? All right. You went to Mike and Becky's tennis courts and saw his generosity there. Some of you will be coming to our new CBA building and be in uh, Goss family classroom and be beneficiary of that. And study abroad programs that he emphasizes. Again, uh, Mike and Becky have been incredibly generous with scholarships for study abroad programs. So I want to take this moment to really thank Mike for everything he does for K-State, day in and day out, uh, for being here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. 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 Thank